दिस भारत एफ एम बजेगा भारत झूमेगा भारत ये है भारत एफएम बजेगा भारत झूमेगा भारत वेलकम फ्रेंड्स लिसनर्स एंड व्यूअर्स टू भारत एफएम ऑन दिस स्पेशल शो फॉर रूबरू एंड आई कॉल इट स्पेशल बिकॉज वी हैव सम स्पेशल गेस्ट्स टुडे हु आर गोइंग टू टॉक अबाउट ह्यूमन ट्रैफिकिंग एंड दिस इज योर होस्ट आशीष झा एंड आई वुड लाइक टू इंट्रोड्यूस each of our host by talking a little bit about them our very first one is ellen firestone who is currently chief operating and service officer for simon i associates the largest independent eye care provider in delaware with nearly 100 staff 25 doctors and 10 locations she has over 25 years of management and consulting experience in corporate and non profit organizations and holds two masters degrees one in business administration and the other in trans- transpersonal studies the study of health and human potential after attending a youth for human rights summit with her son at ucla in 2007 ellen's passion for human rights education began she immediately went into action to make the universal declaration of human rights well known but more than that she enables people to do something about it with her simple yet effective workshop called human rights from education to action for over 10 years ellen has delivered workshops and lectures at schools churches corporations universities the national constitution center in philadelphia and the united nations headquarters in new york she has a growing list of human rights contacts around the globe our second guest tonight is patrick erlandson Patrick was born and he grew up in Los Angeles as the second of seven children. He has been married to his wife Machiko since 1982 and has two adult daughters. He was director of Horizon Galleries in Houston, Texas before moving to Japan for 8 years where he discovered a love of teaching English and continues through private tutoring of adults and children. He returned to California in 2000. In 2002, he opened a thrift store in Lomita, California to support projects for health and children in Africa. He has traveled to Cambodia, Paraguay, Zambia, Israel, Korea, Thailand as well as Canada and Mexico in various capacities of service. In 2010, while working with the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees in Los Angeles, California, For UNHCR Patrick first learned about human trafficking in organs from field agents working in Africa in 2012 he began leading the prevention subcommittee of the Long Beach Human Trafficking Task Force he has become a speaker and activist and organized a number of events such as two youth exploitation safety symposiums for the city of Long Beach two father conferences and most recently second see it end it film and arts festival being a virtual event in 2020 and folks we bring this together with in collaboration with eyes open international eyes open international is a non profit group focused on combating human trafficking through empowerment we have today with us eyes open international president harold isuza and the regional head of india rida rawal with that i would like to welcome all of them ellen first patrick harold and hrida welcome everyone thank, thank you. you so much thank you all right so uh, as i mentioned that uh, today's discussion is basically going to be around human trafficking since that is the topic that we all are very close to and we would like to educate our viewers in understanding what how things go around this very very sensitive subject so ellen i would like to start with you uh, if you don't mind uh, can you tell us a little bit about your journey so far where you are right now uh, how has that been okay thank you sure uh well you you had mentioned in the intro that um i became first aware of the universal declaration of human rights around 2007 
when my son was invited to this uh, Youth for Human Rights Summit. And I, he said to me, I'll go if you go. And that, that's how it all started. So we went to this summit. And I think for me, it was hearing these stories of real life people and these human rights violations. But the one that really got me was human trafficking because you know, here I was in the United States. I really didn't even know this was going on. It was so prevalent in the world and even in, in the, the US. Uh, so I, I sat there and I was thinking, wow, someone really needs to do something about this make this document known. Most people still today, even though the document um, was adopted in 1948, don't even know about it. And uh, so important for all of us to know our human rights so we can promote and protect them, not only for ourselves, but for others. So that that's how it all started. And really it, it was this idea of human trafficking that really got me into action. Thank you, thank you, Ellen. Uh, Patrick, I would uh, like you to talk a little bit about your journey so far. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. I'm so grateful to, to you and to Harold, um, who's become such a dear friend. Um, yeah, for me, it was really when I was working with UNHCR and, and the report that we got was of children leaving South Sudan from the Darfur region and crossing Egypt to get into Israel, uh, where they'd, they'd heard that they would be safe and get jobs. Um, so you had groups of, of unaccompanied children and, you had, and, and others, some adults fleeing the fighting and and i mean you put yourself in the, in the mindset of some of these kids they'd seen their own parents killed they'd what they'd already been through the trauma they'd already experienced and here they're on their way to some place they feel is safe and there were a group of bedouins in egypt they would take them in um feed them give them kind of the comfort of friendship and all the while they would be calling for a doctor to come down from cairo who would then subsequently drug them and cut out their organs and bury them in the desert and, and that to me was, it was such a betrayal of someone at, at, at such a vulnerable point in their lives that I just couldn't get it out of my mind. And, and that drove me to, to researching human trafficking across the board and around the world and, <laughs> and looking at how prevalent it was in the United States, both the labor trafficking side, but, but also just the, the, the massive sex industry in the United States, the commercial sex industry that's, that's created this market and this demand for for young and younger and younger girls, um, that there was just really, I just couldn't, I just couldn't not let it, you know, not let it go on, knowing that that was happening and I was doing nothing about it, and uh, and being the father of two daughters, that kind of gave extra impetus to it. Um, Thank that's you. That's kind of what brought me to here. Yeah. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, Harold, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, I just like to like thank uh, Alan and uh, Patrick because we got connected on we became friends virtually during the COVID or during the <laughs> pandemic. So I'm yeah. not but uh, and that's very honest. Like we have become so close. Like we are like family friends. And uh, I think I met Patrick virtually when I was in India. And Patrick, I'm carrying this for you. I'm going to give that when I'm meeting <laughs> you personally. So this thank is you. from India with love. So, uh, but I think what you uh, you are doing, like you said, you have two daughters, and what Alan, how she got created awareness through her son. What really touched my heart is that you both have never ever been a victim of any crime in terms of human trafficking, but you all are doing so much for the community. That is very important. We need help and support from community members mm -hmm. who are educated and who are professional because this Ashish cannot be eliminated or stopped just between you and me it's a global and a teamwork everybody has to get together within the nation and outside the nation yeah thank you thank you thank you harold Rida, do you have anything to add to that no 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 all right thank you so let's try to answer some difficult questions um first of all this is my understanding and correct me if i'm wrong uh, human trafficking two biggest reasons, as Patrick al already mentioned, one of them, it's the sex trafficking, that is one of them for girls mainly. The second one is the organ uh, trafficking that happens. Are there any other issues with the human trafficking that these things take place, that the human trafficking takes place, other than these two top most ones? They're clearly the two top, top ones. There, there are a variety of others, whether it's child brides, child soldiers, um and and the and the August organ harvesting which is happening especially preying on refugee populations increasingly mm -hmm. you have traffickers going into the refugee populations 
I mean, for all three, I mean, th these three, labor trafficking, sex trafficking, and organs. But yeah, so it, it there are other other areas, but but labor and sex are the two that really dominate and are, and are massively um, economically profitable for traffickers and 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 corporations. Mm -hmm. So what is the reason that even though after having all these laws in place, uh, there are still people who continue to do this? Um, and I believe, this is my understanding again, that I believe the reason they continue to do this is because of the demand that they have. The only reason they can supply is because of the demand that they have. What, and what I fail to understand is the demand that they get from the market or from uh, the countries where they need them could be coming from people who are well educated actually who mm -hmm. understand that this is wrong to do but they are still going ahead and doing it am i right in saying that yes absolutely um just recently maybe um last summer i was contacted by someone i worked with in a in a large corporation she knew that i taught this this human rights um, workshop stuff. And, uh, she linked in with me and said that I needed to read this book. And so I thought I always like follow the leads and I read the book and, and I couldn't believe it. It was, the book was called, I am not your slave. And it was about a young girl who was trafficked across the continent of Africa into the United Arab Emirates. And, um, when, you know, along the way, horrible things happened to her and she survived, which is amazing. Um, the, the girl is like a superhero to me. But it, the point was the person who who she landed in their hands at the end was very, very wealthy. And during, in the book, the um, one of the security guards told her she's probably going to a collector. And she's like, well, what's a collector? And it's, there's actually people in the world who collect women. And I was like, I was shocked. I, I, I remember walking down the hall and, and I read the chapter before I went into work and I was like shaking, thinking, how could this be happening in our world? But it's because there's demand and there's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the thing yeah. that there's someone out there who thinks, you know, and I'm sure it's many people, not just one, that are actually collecting women, young girls. Okay. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, Patrick, go ahead. Yeah, I'd like to add to that too, because to me, it's it's the thing that's actually driving so much of this is a sense of entitlement that that we're we're creating a sense of entitlement to cheap goods that i i'm entitled to whether it's you know cheap clothing cheap whatever then then that feeds that that demand for products that can be produced very cheaply so then you have labor trafficking really exploding to, to be able to provide as much product as possible for as, as low a cost as, as the producers can have um, and then on the sex trafficking side, we have pornography. We have a whole industry that's encouraging men to think that they're entitled to whatever sexual pleasure they want. And, and if they have to go pay for it, they, they will. But it's mm -hmm. to me, those the, the two concerns that have just always been in, in my work on prevention of human trafficking are you're, you're producing vulnerability with what's happened to the family, what's happened to, to with impoverished communities. Mm -hmm. um, you're creating a vulnerability that traffickers can prey upon, and then you're inspiring in people a sense of entitlement that then makes them feel above the law, uh, right. above the concern for a human life. And, mm -hmm. and those two things are just are, are causing this massive problem worldwide. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Patrick, because you just mentioned law, and that was my exactly my next question is, do you think that something like this would be possible without the law enforcement agencies involved in it? Well, I, I think absolutely there are problems with that in in a lot of different countries, and and, and even here we you, you talk about you know law enforcement that that'll exchange favors with girls. Um, I mean, there, there's 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 clearly kind of an opportunity for law enforcement to be corrupted through this because especially with the the amounts of money that you're talking about. Um, but I think that another problem though is just that 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 the laws haven't really been very punitive. They're right you can get away with so much uh, on this end. And especially when you're talking about people making lots of money, mm -hmm. um, you can have the contacts, you can have, you can, you can buy influence. And so that's one of the problems is there hasn't really been a, been a punishment to match the crime. You, when you look at, when you look, especially at sex trafficking and you look at it, it's, it's multi-generational. You corrupt a, you corrupt a human being in that way. And, and there's going to be 
a ripple effect through generations. And yet the punishment is a couple years in prison and people are running their, they're running their stable of girls from prison. It's, there just really isn't the, the, the punishment to match the crime. Mm -hmm. So that was a very good uh, uh, conversation, uh, Patrick. So my next question is for Alan Yu is, uh, do you think the government, uh, like Patrick already mentioned, I, it, he does not think that the government is doing enough when it comes to punishing for people, uh, punishing to people for these crimes. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the reason behind the government not taking this so seriously and not having um, hard punishment where people are scared to even take a step forward with this? Right. I mean, I, I, I don't know exactly. I could only, you know, surmise. Uh, but it, it is interesting. You know, I, I actually interviewed this this young girl who was trafficked across Africa. I, I interviewed her written blog because she's in South Africa. But one of the questions I asked was specifically that about the justice and to her and the author of the book. And they said they tried many, many different ways to to get some justice. And the only the only justice that actually occurred was in her own tribe. So the person who turned her over to the initial traffickers, I guess there was justice there. But then in the end, like these other people that were involved, nothing. And, you know, they wrote to different agencies of the UN, different governments and and nothing occurred. I mean, I even wrote to my senator when I read the book. I wrote to the White House when I read the book because uh, it, it impacted me that much. Um, now, I don't know if, if this thing is so hidden that they really can't get to the source or or what it is or if there's people, you know, in high levels involved. Yeah, that, 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 that was my thought process, too. Uh, so let's talk about uh, why this starts, like people who get involved are those always illiterate people who are not aware of how the human trafficking works and that's why they get into this or is it something more than that uh, i think it's something way more oh go ahead harold no no <laughs> I think no it's something way more than that because there are there are educated people like this this girl was was you know educated she was not illiterate um i i we have a, a person right here who is very educated and um, there, it's just, I think so people get tricked mm. or, or there's, um, you know, uh, family members who are involved and, you know, turn people over it, it, there's all kinds of things going on. It's not just that people, you know, are illiterate or in poverty even. Sorry, Harold, you were going to say something. Yeah. Uh, Ashish, like what Patrick and Alan said, I'm saying from my own personal experience, especially of sex trafficking, like this is having a, with people who are educated, the people who are the perpetrators or people who are highly educated, who has the power and who has the money and the percentage, I would put it point blank. I don't have the stats could be maybe 50%. Wow. And yeah. I'll give a small example. 25 years back when I was in India holding a very high position and I was transferred to Bombay and I was the regional manager for Maharashtra, Gujarat and MP and part of Rajasthan. I just want to share that in marketing, they always say three things, you know, first convince. If you cannot convince that your client or your customer for business, you know, confuse him to get an order, you know, and they say that third, if you cannot convince or confuse him, corrupt him. <laughs> but this is a fact. This I'm taking as real facts. And now I realize the fourth one, which I discovered is seduce him <laughs> or comfort him. So there are four C's convince, wow. confuse, Corrupt and comfort. Now I'll tell you examples. This is something which I've seen with my eyes. I've seen it happening. And I just want to share that when I was in Bombay, there was, I don't want to give the name, there were distributors who used to promote or sell any product. And I used to wonder, like, you're my distributor. You're selling in hygiene products. You're selling in, like, railway products. Well, that's up. I don't have to say in English. He'll just say in Gujarati, Are, sir, I can sell anything because I just need orders. But I said, how do you do it? When this government officials, I said, how do you get these tenders? So he had all these tenders getting approved in his distribution name. But the Saab Kushner, he said, he'll say, sir, I don't have to do anything. And these people are at such a high level that they got so much money. They got everything. But only one thing they don't have or what craze they have is girls. But I just supply one girl to the room, to the hotel. Next day, my tender is signed. Oh, my God. No, this is the fact. I know it's my it's, it's shocking, but this is a fact, uh, Ashish. 
Yeah, I mean, we have seen it in movies, of course. I mean, I, I see a lot of movies, to be very honest. And I have seen this in movies, and it surprises me the level at which it is. And uh, as Patrick mentioned, I think the biggest reason for that is like people knowing very well that the punishment for uh, that is not hard enough where somebody can get scared about taking an, a step forward in this direction. And uh, I, I would like to ask you all, what, what can we do um, to, to stop this or uh, to get better at where it, where it is right now? I just well, want to add think... what Patrick and Alan said uh, that in the US, in the United States of America, in the year 2020, mm -hmm. the prose prosecution rates have gone down. Okay. On human well, trafficking. So basically, when you say sex trafficking, also out of 10, nine do not get prosecuted. And do you do you have any idea why that could be the happening? That is, again, I see we have to make laws very strong. There, this uh, people who are perpetrators or traffickers, which I think Alan and uh, Patrick will talk, you know, like, the, I think that's the reason, like, I wanted to get them on this panel. So I would, <laughs> I would request Patrick to answer that question. <laughs> All right, Patrick, he has put the ball in your court. <laughs> <laughs> Ellen, Ellen, what were you going to say? Oh, no, I, I was going back to the original question, but I do think, you know, things like what you're doing right here, the, creating the awareness is so key because, you know, I, I've been teaching human rights for over a decade. And just a couple of years ago, I was at my brother's house and I mentioned something about human trafficking. He said, well, that doesn't occur in the U.S., I was like, yeah, yeah. yes, it does. You know, people just don't even know because it's something you think has been eliminated. And it, it's like it's so prevalent and it's it's not talked about. You Do you see this on the news every night? No. You know, um, you know, recently I heard a president mention it, but like I didn't know about it till I went to this Youth for Human Rights conference, you know, that it was happening so much. And then I did hear um, one of the senators that I, that I spoke about, I, I heard him speak about it. It's actually Senator Coons. He's the co-chair of the Senate Human Rights Caucus. And this is a very big topic for him, but there's not many people, especially in our country that even talk about it. I talk about it at work. So many times I mention it to people, they've, they've had no idea that it was happening. And many people do not know about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is so key. Article four, it says right in there, no one shall be held in slavery or servitude. They wrote it right there. I, I know. I mean, it, it is there. Everybody knows about it, but it still happens. And it still happens, yeah. before I say anything, I, I know Patrick has been waiting to say something. <laughs> well, I think there are, I mean, about the last couple of points. I mean, one of the problems with prosecution is the complexity of this, especially with sex trafficking, where because in, in especially in America, uh, you know, people have the concept of the movie Taken, you know, girls getting dragged out from under beds and, you know, sold in these kind of shady auctions. But the reality is here, it's much more prevalent to meet somebody online who convinces you that he's a boyfriend, mm -hmm. that he cares about you. And then he and, he and he gradually grooms you to the point where then he can put you out for sale and you think that he's a boyfriend. So it's and it's this is happening. It's tr human trafficking is completely transformed by the Internet because now you have access to everyone. You don't have to go to a poor neighborhood and, and you know, get some girl that's impoverished, you know, get her on drugs and then start selling her. You know, you, you have access to every every 13 year old with a gripe against their parents. I mean, every kid who's got a complaint about home, all it takes is somebody willing to put in the time to listen to them. And eventually you can you can win their trust and win their heart and you can send them a ticket and have them fly to Ireland or wherever. I mean, it's amazing now. Um, a friend of mine, Russ Tuttle, who who works with with teenagers and kids. Um, and it's like 20, I think 26 percent of of kids in middle school and high school have sent a naked picture of themselves to a complete stranger online. So wow. you have a very different reality today. Wow. And, and traffickers have access to pretty much anyone through the Internet. And that's 24 seven. They don't you know, it's they don't have to wait for kids to be wandering around a shopping mall. I mean, they, they basically have access through the Internet and, and, and can start the whole grooming process. But that mm -hmm. makes it complicated for law enforcement. You know, you try to you try to you get this girl and you want her to, to roll over on her trafficker. But she thinks that he's a boyfriend who beats her up and sells her to other men. But so it, it's, you know, that, that quote that's attributed to Harriet Tubman, where, you know, I saved so many hundreds of people and I could have saved so many more if they knew that they were slaves. Um, and, and it's that idea that so many people that I've talked to, so many survivors didn't recognize themselves as victims of human trafficking.
Wow. And, and that's so, exactly so, was my next so, question. Oh. Yeah, that's exactly was my next question, Patrick. That how would someone even know that they are getting involved in it? They are vulnerable. How would how would you know? Because you are trusting someone, like you talked about the boyfriend. I mean, there is a trust and confidence based yeah. on which you are starting with that relationship. And this thing scares you. Like, why would somebody even think of having a boyfriend or, a, or a, I mean, anybody whom they can trust because eventually you don't know where it is going to go. How, how, what can what can a common man uh, do or, or a girl or a woman do to protect herself from this situation? Well, well for me, and it, like the sign behind me, I mean, it's I work a lot with men because I think that the crucial critical missing link in all of this has been fathers and that we have fathers that are being knocked off track you know of, of their sense of responsibility by a number of reasons one of them being pornography um we we have fathers that have been disengaged not present and and not really paying attention to their own children you know in a way that where they're building trust and i think you know some people's response you hear that oh my you know some kid makes a relationship with someone on instagram and the next thing you know they're they're flying to new york for a modeling career, um, you know, you hear about those things, and you want to immediately take away the phones from all of your children and lock them in their bedrooms until they're 18. Um, there's a kind of common visceral response to the kind of th danger that your children face. But, th but the, I think to me, the the critical component that prevents the vulnerability that's being exploited is is a trust relationship with with an adult. And it, it is the best thing is your parents. If your parents can maintain a trust relationship with their children to where the children feel that they can actually come and tell you something without getting reamed and, and slammed mm -hmm. in, the in their room for the next 10 months, mm -hmm. you know, they're going to be able to open up about these things. And if it's not a parent, we need, we need mentors. We need people who can stand in a position of, of trust and responsibility who understand the dangers, who understand that when you start talking to someone online and they're not giving you any information about themselves, but they're they're feeding on your dream. All they're doing is is echoing back any dream that you've told to them. They're going to echo it right back to you and, and promise you that they're going to help you reach it. Um, so that if if children can start to be educated about about the 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 techniques that these guys use, because I mean, I, I spent I had to speak on a panel just recently, and I and I listened to hours and hours of pimps telling their stories on YouTube. Wow. And these guys are very clear. How you manipulate, how you manipulate girls, how you use a carrot and a stick, and they're they're boastful and proud, and they feel completely entitled to to take a young girl and turn her into a product, um, and sell her over and over and over again, and 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 we can we have to learn the techniques that they're using, and then be able to explain it in a way that that kids can start to recognize. I've had that every time I've spoken at a high school, I've had kids in the back of the room going, "Whoa, that's what that is." And, and it's like they, they start to recognize this is happening to their friend or their sister. Or, you know, increasingly it's happening to boys, you know, and, and boys are being approached through through video games. Um, it's it's predators anywhere kids are. Predators are finding a way in. And, and it's. So, so are there materials, are there enough materials online where uh, all these kids can actually go there and try to understand how these predators work and what what their uh, pattern is and what how do they execute is that available somewhere on the internet where do they get that information from oh, i think it's it's increasing the the number of people that are doing great work i mean the stop trafficking project is one where they work directly with middle school and high school kids and they speak at their level and they're really they're really aware of what's happening in their lives and and that's really important to me, I think we need we need an increase in resources for parents, because parents parents need to know what their kids are going through. It's it's not the same reality. I mean, when I was growing up, and and the reality even for my daughters, but now even for for kids that are 10, 11, 12, it's a whole nother world. And and as parents, we need to understand what our kids are going through, because if we're insensitive to it, they're going to go find somebody else who listens, and and that's where the danger lies. You know, kids are going to go find an, find someone older who who gets what they're going through. And if their parents don't, it's going to be somebody who's going to use it against them. Thank you, Patrick. Ellen, do you want to add something to that? Um, you know, I, I just think that, you know, what Patrick said, it's it's about people or young people who are vulnerable. Um, and also, I, I heard a story once of uh, 
a girl who got into trafficking, but it was because her friend was in it. Her friend was telling her how she got this great job and, you know, lures her her best friend to come with her. And, you know, she's all of a sudden in the hands of a trafficker. So it's again, I think the the parents and the the family is so key that, you know, you keep that really close relationship. And but I mean, obviously not everyone uh, has that luxury, I guess. Right. Right. Wow. OK. So uh, how how do how do we I mean, say, suppose you are in a situation where you know about all these things and you still get involved, like for whatever reason, again, trust, confidence, whatever reason, you did not realize that you got into it. And now you are in that position where you are part of it. Now, if you want to get out of it, the biggest problem I feel is going to the law enforcement. Are they scared uh, both either from the law enforcement or from the people who she, who that person is involved with? Mm -hmm. uh, what can they do at that point when they realize that, okay, now I need to get out of this. What can they do? Um, well, it depends on where you are. Um, some, some cities are, are way ahead of the game and, and some communities are way, way behind. And, uh, I mean, I was horrified when I heard that the, when the, when the police would go out to, to check on prostitutes and they called it the trash run. Um, in, in, in Los Angeles, that's changed a lot. We, we have human trafficking task forces within the Long Beach, within the, the police force, within the sheriff's department. You have, you have people that are specifically trained. They know exactly how to talk to, to victims um, to get them to open up. Uh, we, need, we need to expand that. But I think if you if someone is trying to get out, there there are so many organizations um, that are actually going out on the streets, um, making sure that people know that if if it's if you really want to get out of this, there's there's a way out. Um, so there are there is an increase of of people that are that are doing that kind of work actually to to let people know that they can get out. Um, so so you know there there are people who are putting phone numbers, hotline phone numbers, in bathrooms of motels. Um, so. You know the girl's got to use the bathroom, and she can she can then write down that phone number, or she can make a call, or even text. Um, so th there are there's an increase in in ways that can help someone get out. I mean the problem the problem for a lot of the the people who are being victimized is that they're they're more afraid of the police because of what they're being told by their trafficker. They're being told that the that the cops are all in on it, that the right. cops are going to return her to the trafficker, that there isn't going to be the support there, and that's. It, that's not necessarily true. Um, I think I think law enforcement, from what I've seen, we have some very committed people in law enforcement, and there's a lot of very dedicated people, whether it's in the FBI or in local law enforcement, that are that are really really concerned. There, I mean, they are really sincerely, genuinely out there to to help um, victims to get out. Um, but the problem is is having someone who feels that they can trust trust law enforcement when they've been indoctrinated to believe that they're you know, that, that they're not gonna help. I, I had one experience, we had a, a demonstration of men standing against trafficking, uh, you know, on a street corner where trafficking happens outside of a hotel where one girl was killed by her trafficker. And uh, and someone posted a picture of us on the street. And I got a message on Facebook from a girl in Canada who had been trafficked. And and what she wrote, she said, I never knew that there were men who cared. Wow. And, and in, in her mind, every single man was a customer. Oh wow! Right? It didn't matter whether you were a judge or a policeman or a priest. It didn't matter who you were. Mm -hmm. All men to her were a customer, and we have to change that. And that's where I feel so, like, just really motivated to to get more men involved in standing up against trafficking because mm -hmm. th th this is kind of the thing that's been missing. And and as long as people, you know, girls who are in the life are looking at every man that way, you know, that's that's mm -hmm. tough. They don't feel like there's very much hope to get out. Right. I, I would agree. I would agree, Patrick. I mean, this is this is very scary, and to be very honest, mm -hmm. um, and and especially uh, as you mentioned that the that confidence of uh, trusting someone and that that goes away the moment you come to know that you have gotten involved into this. To build up that confidence again is a big deal. I mean, how how do you trust anyone at that point? Uh, that that's the biggest challenge that you have at that point. Like you have no clue who is going to help you and who is going to actually make it worse for you. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, Harold, uh, 
you you have yourself been part of uh, this um, and uh, i think most of the world actually now knows your story and uh, uh, you were very brave to uh, take action um against what was happening with you what was going on with you uh, to the point that uh, there were some gunshots right um uh, that and uh, you you what you did is something where you need lot of courage to do that i think one of the biggest reason people uh, stop themselves from moving forward is the fear of losing life and uh, to that this is my personal opinion and personal thought process if i was them then i would just ask myself one question is this life better than death the kind of life that i am leading right now Mm-hmm. would i not at least give it a shot and try and see if i get if i can get a better life what would you like to say about that harold no i just want to, this is a very powerful ashish and i'll tell you before that that what you are doing today ashish and what riday is doing what alan is doing and what patrick is doing this is the main thing that we are trying to create awareness that victims and survivors who are watching this right now or mm-hmm. who might watch later on a youtube that then they are very scared to contact their parents for rescuing them or for freeing them or to the law enforcement agencies because that is the mindset but for the vic- for the victim or a survivor to contact you on a phone like or like how that girl contacted patrick or to me i got so many calls ashish from domestic violence from girls and guys here in the united states of america after watching all this social media that you are doing so i'm very thankful to bharat fm and to you because this itself is the first platform and they are telling me I said, "Did you tell your mom?" "Well, the no, Harold. If I tell my mom, she'll kill me." See, yeah, you're right. That that's I exactly. Know, this is this is a fact. I said, "Did you tell so and so?" "Well, the no, I cannot." And they tell me everything, and like then I said, "Okay, then that is a fact." So during my case also, I was scared of law enforcement agency. I thought I'll because perpetrators or these traffickers in sex and labor trafficking they use four words, especially labor trafficking. I always keep keep on telling. I'll get you arrested. I'll get you handcuffed. I'll get you jailed, and I'll, I'll get you deported. That's what. And most of the time, like you said, or what Patrick said, Ashish, ninety-nine percent of the victims, when they are into this of labor trafficking or sex trafficking, they themselves are not aware that they are a victim of human labor trafficking or sex trafficking. I would agree. Yeah. I myself didn't know. Like I'll be very honest. If you go to, I just want to give a small example. Uh, before uh, alan speaks is that if you talk to a mexican here in cincinnati also ashish if you see somebody and he say hey are you a victim of human trafficking where you are very convinced and he'll say no 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 ashish i'm not i am happy oh acha so what do you do oh he say i work in a restaurant oh good man so what are you doing he said like you lax him he'll say i'm a dishwasher oh wow good so how much money you get he'll say i got 1500 dollars he said wow man that's mucho mucho trabajo mucho uh, dinero He says, "No, no, mucho trabajo, poquito dinero." Then he say, "So you get oh, like uh, bi-weekly?" He said, "No, I get it monthly, for one month." Oh, so you work five days a week? He'll say, "No, I work seven days a week." Oh, oh my God! Then he say, "Oh, so how many hours? You work eight hours?" He he does not know how many hours. He say, "I go in the morning at nine o'clock. I come home at ten o'clock, ten thirty, eleven o'clock." Now you calculate the hours and the days. In a week, he's putting eighty hours. Mm-hmm. and if you calculate into hours he just gets 5 dollars per hour or 3 dollars 50 cents per hour wow. no more time so people think in human labor trafficking or say that oh you'll be in the you, your hands are like you are handcuffed you are in the thing no you are out in the open but that mm-hmm. is how this perpetrators operate in their psychopath so mm-hmm. you know like and it's very difficult to come out like in my situation also when my trafficker hired a guy to kill me i always tell when you see movies and when you get see people shot you get so excited wow what a movie it's a thriller you know mm. but when you see blood yourself you forget everything in life you forget to get a citizenship you forget to get, you don't want green card you don't want anything you are only thinking how i'm going to survive right. i don't think it's a fact your your this doesn't work mind so, you just don't know you have like you are running like a rat i was running like a rat i did not i i did not know that if i get up in the morning i'll see the evening right right so what you all are doing and that's the reason i tell you know i tell the victims i tell the survivors see here look on the social media look at patrick look at alan or look at riday look at ashish you know they are not here to get you arrested they are here to help you because victims in human labor trafficking they are scared hmm. 
Hmm. Hmm. I'm trying to remove that mindset. Mm-hmm. And here for law enforcement agency. So once again, I have to thank uh, Bharat FM. I have to thank Ashish. I have to thank what you know. Go to the website of Seat Ended. Hmm. Go website. You know, like you say, where can they go? Go to Firestone website. Hmm. Call Alan. Go email hmm. Alan. Email hmm. Patrick. Email uh, Riday. Or email me. Or hmm. call me. Or even email you. Hmm. Yeah, call exactly. Them. Because hmm. today you have contacts. Right. They're more comfortable talking to you than to the law enforcement agency, which is a fact. I can't deny that. Thank right. you. Now, now, Harold, you must have already mentioned this multiple times. But how did you get the courage of going against what was happening with you, knowing very well that that is very dangerous? You have two sons, you have a wife, you have a family. What made you do what you did? I'll be very honest. I did it for my two sons, for Bradley and Rowan, because my sons were four years old and seven years old, and they, my pu- perpetrator openly threatened me like they show in the movie, I'll kill you, and which he meant it. And I surrendered, you know, but I was telling and I just gave up. I surrendered like I gave up. And then I was talking to my wife like this on a dining table. And I was telling my wife, you know, that, you know, I'm going to die. It means we are just having a, and I could see it. I was like half my weight. You could not recognize me physically, mentally, whatever. So my younger son, Rohan, who was playing on the floor facing the wall. I'll tell you, he came and tapped me. I always tell, do not be scared what the child speaks, but mm. be scared what the child sees and hears. He comes and taps me and I look behind. He tells me, Dadu, if you die, what happens to me? Who will take care of my schooling? Like there are so many episodes that came into my I said that, my God, and I had given up. And then I said, like, if, he di- if I die, he dies. If I die, my wife dies. If I die, my older son dies. It was like God talking to me, Harold, come on, you cannot die. You got to live. And that is when I decided one day that I was not talking for 10 years, Ashish. Mm. I didn't know it was like a stigma. I said then one day I took a I took an oath on my two sons' head when they were sleeping. I said, whatever I do will come in the media. I don't care. If I do die, I will die. Because if my death is written in whosoever hands, like they say in, in India, mm. Kashi no Maran. Right. Right. So I said, if my death, one then one thing that fear of death went out of me. I'll tell you one thing, honest, Ashish. I do not have 10,000 days. 10,000 days is 27 years, four months. Nobody gets a permanent visa on this planet. Whether it is Joe Biden, Amita Bachchan, of course. Harold D'Souza, and all who are, you know, we, we have to go one day. We have only 36,000 days ka visa. Mm. And that's 100 years. And some people will leave more. So yeah. I said, when I have to die, okay, I'll die. If it's, but so then the fear factor went out of my head. And I said, come out, come and shoot me. I had told the judge, take a gun and put on my head and kill me. I'll, I'll come, come shoot me now, kill me. Wow. So I'm not scared now because I have to die. But if I have to die with your hand, but I'm not going to stop. Because I always tell this, like see it, end it. Firestone website, Eyes Open Trust or Eyes Open International will continue. Harold D'Souza is going to die. It's a fact. I'm going to die. Whether today or tomorrow, I'm going to die. But Eyes Open International will not die. See it, end it will not die. Firestone website will not die. Bharat FM will not die. That is correct. Thank you, Harold. Thank you for sharing that once again. Uh, so let's talk about see it, end it, uh, Ellen. How how does that work? Well, see, then it's that's mine. Patrick. Oh, that's Patrick. I'm sorry. That's Patrick. Yeah, sorry, Patrick. Yeah. How does that work? Man, I want to tap into Harold's energy. <laughs> <laughs> he's like a movie star man with the dialogue yeah. exactly. he sets the bar really high for yeah, no, how we I need know. to approach things um, so see it in it I, I, I would say the two areas that I became really in, increasingly concerned in after like eight years of working in prevention was you know one was the fathers like I mentioned is what's happening in the home and creating vulnerability but the other is is culture is is the media that's normalizing looking at people a certain way, that's it's normalizing uh, a behavior that's becoming more and more and more prevalent. And, and that behavior is, is extremely exploitive. It's, it's seeing people as a commodity. So my idea was instead of just having a screening of one film, you know, at a church basement somewhere, like let's, let's get some, some great films, some music, some, some you know, phys- you know the, the visual arts, um, poetry. Let's bring all of the artists together around this issue. How do we raise awareness in a way that really bypasses just the mind and hits people in the heart and says, this is a reality. 
Um, this is something that's actually happening to real human beings. And it could be happening to someone in my child's school. It could be happening to someone, you know, within within blocks of my home. And so how do we make that real? And so so my my thinking was we really need we really need the arts. We have to get film, we have to get music, we have to get all of those on the same page of saying, you know, children and vulnerable people should not be preyed upon, you know, like in, in our world today. This is the 21st century, for God's sake. Yeah. We should not be having millions of people that are enslaved and being right. treated as as a disposable product. Mm. And and so I think that the more we can get, you know, the entertainment world, get get you know quality films, um, telling a story, making this real to people, we can really start to to get people then to actively change. So the first event we had was a live event in a movie theater, and uh, and so we had people would watch a film, we'd have a panel discussion. Or, you know, where you peel off some of the layers of the onion and get down to some some real nuts and bolts of what's happening. Um, I'll never forget, we had, after one of the films, we had a, a panel discussion, a woman stood up in this, you know, theater audience and said, I've never told anybody this, but I was trafficked when I was a teenager. And her husband sitting next to her with his mouth open because he he didn't know. And and she was she was saying, you have to take this serious. This is really happening to people. And she goes, I've kept silent for all these years. But this is really happening, and and people walked out of the theater, went straight up to organizations that were there waiting and saying, "What can I do to help?" And and I think this is the critical thing: awareness by itself, it, it just makes people want to go home and have a beer and watch TV and kind of forget what they've heard. But we have to we have to engage them quickly. They have to they have to have their hearts moved and then go find something quickly that they can do, and then it, then they're then they're in, they're they're bought in, they're playing a part in actually making this end. And that is just so important that we make it as easy as possible for people to engage and take some action. That, that's why for me, men standing against trafficking is one of those things. Men don't want to you know, go out and get too, too obvious about it, but they want to do something. They feel like, man, I just, I don't want this to be happening. So yeah. they'll come out and hold up a sign, right? And then little by little, they start getting accustomed to the idea of taking a stand for something it is it is really a, a, a modern day evil that, that just that just shouldn't be continuing. And we need more men engaged. And so again, see it ended was really that. It was we, we had the first live event, then we went to an online event in 2020 because of COVID. And uh, and we really want to expand it. We want to have film festivals in India and South America. And we this is something that we can use a platform to get a message out using you know films that are being produced in these different languages and, and, and approaching the issue in different ways in a powerful way that really impacts your heart. And, and so that's the, the vision for See It End It will be, this is a, a platform we can we can start to bring all of the arts together and get mm -hmm. messaging out to people in a way that they can receive it. So we're waiting for Harold's film. Um, <laughs> and uh, th there's just, there's, there's a, you know, what I found too is I've put on conferences before and there's a certain type of people that go to conferences and there's a certain type of people that don't. And we need to be able to reach those people that are not gonna sit down in a, in a symposium or a conference, but but also get them educated about human trafficking. And the film festival was really, really powerful, really powerful experience for people. Thank you, Patrick, thank Patrick, you. On behalf of all the victims and survivors, we love you. <laughs> thank you, Patrick, yeah. So Ellen, uh, what are, what is you, what is that your organization or the organization that you are involved with doing uh, to uh, stop us? Uh, and how are you doing that? if you can give us a little insight into that. Sure, Ashish. So, um, you know, as all this conversation was going on, there were three words that that kept going through my head. And it was, you had mentioned earlier, and Harold talked about courage. Um, and then we also had talked about justice. And the other word, I think Patrick even just mentioned is action. And how all those those three go together. So the the justice, I know for me, there was a quote by Martin Luther King, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Okay. And I think that for, for all of us, if we see something going on, even though it seems far away, guess what? We're responsible, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and the, um, the idea of courage, the victim, of course, it takes so much courage to get out of that situation. But in a way, the way our society is, it takes courage to get involved to help someone. Like people would rather tur turn away, you know, and, you know, it takes some courage to actually look and see what's going on and think, hey, I might have some responsibility for that or I can do something about it. 
And I think when I first started getting involved in with Youth for Human Rights, United for Human Rights, you know, their purpose was to put out materials so people could easily be educated about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And I love that idea. I love people should be educated, but I wanted to take it a step further. And that's why I made the workshop from education to action. So get people to look at, okay, there's these 30 human rights. Which one do you feel most strongly about? Because there's probably a nonprofit or NGO out there already doing something about it. Get involved with them, help, you know, volunteer, whatever it is, but get into action because yeah, there may be these evil people out there, but there's way more good people. Mm. And so if those good people don't do anything, then the evil can continue. And that, that was another quote I know I, I've heard about, you know, the only way evil can continue is for good people to do nothing. So, you know, there's that, the courage for, for everyone really, the taking responsibility for the justice, we can do something and just get into action. Mm. Um, the website that I put together it was both for an individual reason, ignite your basic purpose. I took that word Firestone and used it to ignite and then help create a fair and free world, right? One of these human rights, you, there's probably something there that will ignite something in you, then then get involved, do something. And it doesn't have to be create a nonprofit. It could be I volunteer with somebody or, or something, but just to help other people, that's what we're here to do as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> No, that's, that's, I really appreciate this. This has been awesome. And to hear, you know, what everyone is doing and that we just need more people doing it. Right. And and, and I was about to come to that question, uh, Ellen, as well, mm -hmm. that uh, what is the reason that good people are not doing enough because of which the evil people are doing what they are doing? Uh, is it the fear of uh, losing their life or fear of uh, their family being hurt. What, what do you think is the reason that the good people are not coming forward enough that they should be? Um, I, well, I think part of it is not knowing. Um, I think, like I said, there's so, still today, this document's not even known. And the one thing I really like about the U UDHR, I don't know if you know all 30 human rights, but when I teach it, people could usually list three or five, right? But in addition to saying no slavery, no torture, there's also things built in for you know, uh, instead of not only just surviving, but thriving, you know, the right to education says it, education should be directed towards the full development of the human personality. I mean, if you go into our schools, that's not really happening. I mean, Patrick talked about the arts. I mean, there, there's so much more to a human being than just, you know, taking a test. So really getting out there and developing people's full personalities, um, get them involved in something good on their purpose line, and some, you know, that's going to naturally take care of some of these things. Uh, I don't know how you really, you know, the, the evil people stop, but maybe if when they were in school, if they were on this line of their full personality, developing their full personality, maybe they wouldn't have gone off in this bad direction. All right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen, for that. Uh, we have like about seven minutes left and Rida has been awesome quite. Yeah. So <laughs> I I just want to ask you when it comes to India, what is the story? And if you would like to share a little bit about what is going on in India and what is India doing about it? So India is basically a source country, a transit country, and a destination country. So when Harold D'Souza came to US and got trafficked, in that case, India is the source country and US is the destination country. Like that. From Nepal, many people have been trafficked to UAE. The route is from Nepal, they visit India, they have been taken to India, New Delhi, and from there they have been taken to UAE. In that scenario, India is a transit country. And many people from India and from Pakistan, from Nepal, Bangladesh, many people have been trafficked to India also. So in that case, India is a destination country and those are the source countries. So like this. And when we talk about different factors of human trafficking, so I would say that every region, every vicinity, every country have somewhat different kinds of factors. In India, the main reason for human trafficking is poverty. Besides this, there are many, there are more than 100 languages in India. We have many caste, creed, color, religion. Every each and every factors is responsible for human trafficking. In India, we have upper caste and lower caste. So lower caste people are being 
neglected from the society the lgbtq community are being neglected from the society so they don't get any proper job they are in search for job they don't have money and then this is the main reason they are being trafficked or they have been trapped by the perpetrators and they are into human trafficking in india if you move around then you will see small small children on roads at the chai chai point they are washing dishes or something so in that case they are not uh, those kids are not a victim of human trafficking or a child labor they are poor and just they are helping their father in morning they go to school and at night they are helping their father so there are thin lines between that in child labor and child trafficking in india so india has set up ahtu anti human trafficking units and it's been dispersed in all of the states and they are working very good also in india many norms have been stricken recently for human trafficking but what i would like to say that what eyes open international india is doing so in india we have opened a branch eyes open trust eyes open trust and eyes open international united states work under the same banner eoi in india there are many ngos who are working on ground level they are doing investigation and rescue operations so we collaborate with those ngos we collaborated with many healthcare workers many lawyers and also many other people whom we can get help from so when a case comes to us so we directly transfer that case to our doctors who whom we collaborated with or to the lawyers and get the help immediately as Harold D'Souza was the advisory council committee member of White House. The same thing we are planning to do in India to start an advisory council committee led by the survivors, because only the survivors can know the pain what he or she has gone through and can take proper decisions. Agreed. Also, you have that polar you have human trafficking hotline number in United States. In India, we do not have such. a big human trafficking hotline number there are numbers for child labor there are numbers for sexual exploitation but for human trafficking there is no such hotline number and then we are going to launch it soon also so, in india yes, yes we have a number riday can you say that yeah yes. so in india we are promoting my own mobile number you can call me anytime 24 by 7 365 days riday raul is available for anyone the number is plus 91 Seven double nine zero two six two six three two. If you are worried of the police, if you are worried of your perpetrator, doesn't mind. Just call me. I am here to help you, no matter what. So let me ask you this: Is the government working with you for this wonderful cause, or if, are there any challenges that you are having to uh, implement this in India? So I would like to ask Harold Dishuza to answer this question, as we have recently. Done an event with the police commissioner of Karnataka, and he is a good friend of Dishuza. So, Mr. Dishuza will explain that how he got collaborated, like this police commissioner of Karnataka, and how government and EU is working together. Yeah, I just like to add, you know, like Riday is doing a very fabulous job in India. Eyes open trust, and uh, Ashish, uh, you know it very honestly. Like, it's not an easy uh, climb to reach the government officials. So, we are still working at the. at the pmo's office to start their advisory council on human trafficking engaging survivors honestly from the community from the law enforcement agencies we have collaborated with the high end police officials i cannot name it right now on the media for their social uh, uh, privacy we have prince manvinder singh who is from the lgbtq and we are getting lot of support but uh, we are very confident in by this year end we will make a breakthrough because there is a biopic film coming up uh, on human trafficking or on a survivor story and lot of organizations are helping us or collaborating with us so that's a very positive thing like you know just creating awareness in india the culture cultural it is something like they think oh that's it's part of life but that's human trafficking or labor trafficking mm-hmm. right that awareness we are creating yeah, right. thank you thank you thank you harold now before we end this one question has been bothering me uh, sorry go ahead ruday you have something to add also we are missing one main point all of you have discussed how human trafficking is going through to internet but in internet also human trafficking is very much popular over the dark web dark web is a thing where not only bitcoins and all, all those all of the stuff happen but human trafficking also happens there are buyers there are sellers and there are bidding 
done on dark web of organs and of sex trade so is the major concern nowadays the dark web is can anything be done about dark web do you know yes of course in obama administration yeah. they have set up a full committee and a team for fighting against the dark web people are doing this but it's very difficult to catch them mm. and every day new technology comes new programming language comes every now and then so it's uh, fight continuous fighting between them okay all right every new it takes place every now and then yeah we we have come to the end of our hour but i have to ask you this question harold uh, you were talking about uh, a story where in like you uh, came to know about a person who works in a restaurant and was working 7 days a week and for an m number of hours every day uh, and this question uh, always comes to my mind because uh, there is an organization in the us i don't want to name that organization uh, which is also uh, notorious i would say of uh, exploiting their employees is what i have heard again this is this is based on my knowledge from what i read on the internet and what people talk about but at the same time is it possible that the person who is agreeing to be in that situation could be in a worse situation if they try to get out of that situation because they might not be able to earn anything if they don't continue doing what they are doing what do you think about that that's a million dollar question and to be honest ashish i am working on uh, expungement felony uh, uh, freedom for immigrant workers so i've been working with the attorney general's office with the governor's office i got lot of support in ohio i got more than 200 applicants so where i'm working to get expungement of felonies for human labor trafficking especially foreign nationals so there is a law in place for victims of sex trafficking and like you rightly said these victims are very scared to come out and share or even to come out because they what is they think what will not get justice mm. which is true i agree i, I tell them also at so one thing is good that i'm already working on one particular case at the oh. governor's office I don't, nice. i don't want to disclose that i think like you know but uh, i can i think i'll just talk about this lady it is i always call her sabina aunty her name is sabina G gabriel so she is there on the thing so we are working on a one particular case where she has not met her entire family back in india for the last 25 years number one she was a victim of domestic servitude in new york i met her here personally in cincinnati and after meeting her after talking to her for almost 8 months or 1 year it is then when i came to know she used to always tell me that harold i used to get 2000 my salary was 2000 my salary was 2000 in 98 and one fine day after one year i said oh my that was a good salary now look at me and my wife were sitting there and she said harold it was 2000 rupees oh my i can you imagine see like how how we assume and right. today, i'll be very honest i'm very thankful to the mike divine our governor of ohio dave host who is the attorney general you know they are they are supporting my mission or may, not my mission it's our mission to end this modern day slavery and they are working to get a status for this lady they are trying to do everything and they are even trying to get her family on a visit here so that she gets united and meets her son or daughter or grandkids so that's a very positive sign right so okay. like you know so these are the things we are working on and i need the support like what bharat fm is doing what uh, patrick uh, like seat and date or alan you know and what rizal rahul is doing so i need that support from you all because this is not about me we got mm -hmm. to think of the victims we got to think of the survivors and that's why we are trying to be the voice for the voiceless mm -hmm. yeah yeah thank, thank you. you thank you harold and uh, as you rightly mentioned we all need to come together against this and support each other with a wonderful cause and try to stop this now before i formally end this uh, program is there any last few words anybody has to say yes i want i, I, I want I, i want patrick and alan to end with something for our, our okay all right topic. so let's go in that order patrick you first and we want to end the show with alan okay uh, my my thinking is always what, what we really need is a is a what father boyle of homeboy industries in los angeles calls radical kinship we really need to start looking at each other as a human family and as and as members of our of our family not as the other and and that's critical and if i can just share one short story of abriana park was a girl who was in 17 years old she had been accepted in a university i'll make this really fast um she was going to be a lawyer she met somebody on instagram she ended up being trafficked in the summer before she was going to go start school she got caught um her trafficker thought that she that she told the police about her she was found stabbed 17 times and left in a gutter in a neighborhood 
to me, this is just unacceptable that we're losing talent. We're losing people who have creativity. They have a contribution to make to our human family mm -hmm. and we're losing them to this exploitation. And that's yeah. why it's just urgent. It's urgent that we take back you know, the, these lives that are being lost. They're, each one of them is an irreplaceable human being that has a part to play in making our world a, a more sane, healthy, and, and happy place. Thank you, Patrick. Ellen, you are ending it. Okay, well, first, you know, I just want to thank everyone here. It has been amazing. And um, Harold, uh, I know we will be friends for life. I mean, I'm so happy that we met. Uh, but I think the um, in the end here, one thing that stood with me for, for many, many years is this, this saying from the Bible, and I really haven't been you know, a good Bible reader, but it was, um, to he who much is given, much will be expected. And I do think um, there is a thing of, of, there's few people in this world who have been given a lot, and I don't want to put any pre pressure on them, but it is the idea too of the human family. We're here to help each other. And some people, you know, have been given more than others in, in the, especially in the case of financial um, and to use that to help, you know, our human family here in whatever way you can. And um, it's, it's just super important, the idea of helping each other. Thank you, Ellen. Uh, so with that, we come to the end of this discussion. And uh, I must say that it was a, a very wonderful discussion, a lot of uh, source of information for a lot of people to come forward and support us, reach out to us and fight against this uh, evil cause that we have. Uh, and uh, I, I would like to let all our listeners and viewers know that this video will be available on our website, on our Facebook page, on our YouTube channel. So if you want to refer someone to go through this discussion and uh, understand that how they can help each other out, I, sh I should say that on, on, as Ellen already mentioned that good people need to come forward to end this evil cause. Only then the evil can uh, be defeated. So, and for that to happen, let's, uh, pledge ourselves and make sure that we will fight against this by coming together, by supporting each other. And uh, with that, I would like to end this program. Thank you very much, Ellen. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Harold. And thank you, Riddhi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Much. Much. All right. thank you. Bye. You have a wonderful weekend. Bye. Bye-bye. This is Bharat FM. Bajega Bharat, Jhumega Bharat. <laughs>